Hey everybody, Dr. O. Let's talk spinal cord and reflexes. Let's jump right in. So define a reflex. So when you're using, when there's lots of different definitions for reflexes, at least that I've seen in my career. Um, to me, rapid and automatic are the key. So a rapid automatic response that you don't have to consciously think of is what a reflex is. So to me, reflexes buy your brain time. So if you touch a hot stove, Rather than that, that signal being sent to your brain, like, this is hot, this is painful, what should we do about it? Let's think about this. We should probably pull our hand away. Let's do that. Um, that takes too long. So if, if, you're gonna, if you're about to get hit by a bus, quickly, reflexively seeing that moving bus and getting out of its way is going to is going to save you precious time. So there's the quick and the dead, right? So basically, reflexes are going to buy the rest of your brain and nervous system time to make more thought out decisions. So hopefully you learn from touching that hot stove and you don't do it again and or whatever, right? But but this rapid automatic response is a reflex. Now we'll we'll kind of play around with what the definition of reflex is a little bit more later because I think that a lot of the things that we do we basically turn into reflexes. We uh, think about your habits, things that become unconscious or subconscious. At some level, those are reflexes. So we'll talk about that. Okay, um, just basic anatomy of the spinal cord. So the kind of spinal cord is going to be largest at the top and it's going to taper down primarily, except for some enlargements we'll talk about. So um, at what vertebral level does the spinal cord end? It actually ends between L1 and L2. So you might think your spinal cord goes all the way down, but it doesn't. Um, it ends between L1 and L2. The reason that's significant is because if they're going to do a spinal tap, they're going to go in um, to, your, to your vertebral column. They're going to go below that level to make sure they don't hit spinal cord. So between L1 and L2. Define the conus medullaris and the cauda equina. So the conus medullaris is the tip, the end of the spinal cord, and that's going to be at that L1 to L2 level. The cauda equina, that actually means horse's tail, so caudal means towards the tail, equine, so cauda equina or the horse's tail, that's going to be these large nerves that are dangling below the end of the spinal cord that are going to, of course, you need, you need nerves to travel farther than below L1 and L2. So these large nerves that are going to be, be your lumbar, lower lumbar and sacral nerves, they're the they're the cauda equina. All right, what are these cervical and lumbar enlargements for? So like I was saying, your spinal cord starts really big and it tapers down, but there's going to be a cervical enlargement and then later on there's going to be a lumbar enlargement. That's because it takes way more nerves to control my arms than it does, you know, a section of my thoracic cavity, uh, etc. So the, the cervical enlargement is where all the extra nerves are coming from and going uh, that control your arms and your lumbar enlargement, same thing for the legs. So, so the spinal cord, so why is the spinal cord bigger at the top and taper down? Well, think about it. As you travel up the spinal cord, it's all the sensory and motor commands that are needed at that level, plus all the information that has to travel down or up from, from lower levels. So the, 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 the first spinal segment, that C0, C1 area, the spinal cord has to be huge because all the motor can't come out commands at that level and below have to be there, and all the sensor information traveling up from the entire body has to be there too. But these enlargements are going to be where they actually do get larger on the way down to control your limbs. How many spinal segments are there? There are, excuse me, there are 31. So you actually have, uh, you have eight cervical spinal segments, even though there's only seven cervical vertebrae. That's why I said C0, 12 thoracic spinal segments. Then you have the lumbar, sacral, and even coccygeal segments as well. So 31. What are the three layers of the spinal meninges and what is its function? So the spinal meninges and cranial meninges are the same thing. It's just a measure, a difference of location. So uh, the outside, the tough fibrous layer of the meninges is called the dura mater. In the middle, we have the arachnoid mater, and that name comes from the fact that it has this kind of spider web appearance. And then inside, the thinnest, most delicate layer of the, of the spinal meninges is the pia, P-I-A, pia mater. So what is its function? Uh, if you think about it, your brain, your, your cranium, your skull, and your spinal cord column are designed to protect your brain and spinal cord from the outside, right? If you fall, if you fall, obviously you want to have a nice hard head to protect you. Your, um, your meninges, as well as the cerebral spinal fluid that's in and around these meninges, they're designed to protect your brain and spinal cord from your bones. So, th so it's great that we have our axial skeleton, our rib cage, our, our vertebral, our vertebrae, and our cranium protects us. But when you, when you fall, what protects your brain from the inside of these bones? What protects your spinal cord from the inside of these bones? That's what the spinal meninges do, as well as cerebral spinal fluid. 
All right, which half of the spinal cord is motor and which half is sensory? So the anterior or ventral half of the spinal cord is motor. The, the posterior or dorsal half of the spinal cord is sensory. That's why you'll see that the, um, the dorsal root ganglion is where your, where your sensory nerves cell bodies are, whereas your, your motor nerves, their, their cell bodies are going to be in the anterior horn, the front of the spinal cord. So if you damage the front of the spinal cord, you'll affect motor function. If you damage the back of the spinal cord, you'd affect sensory function. What is a dermatome? So I'm sure you've all seen a dermatome map. It's basically a distribution. So which parts of the skin are controlled by which spinal segments? And the reason, so dermatomes, as well as things like understanding referred pain patterns, the reason they're helpful is they can tell you which spinal level someone's having problems are. If, if you want to assess someone and you think they've damaged their spinal cord and you want to figure out where, uh, the dermatome would certainly matter. So the referred pain might, might matter as well but then your, re your reflexes and muscle strength. So you do a neuromusculoskeletal exam, you look for any sign of a weak muscle, any sign of a weak reflex, or any sign of, of strange function of a dermatome, and that's going to tell you. So you know someone has low back problems and they potentially herniate a disc, that's going to tell you did they herniate the L3 disc, the L4 disc, the L5 disc, that kind of thing. So the dermatome would be that, would be that map. Um, you can have, you can certainly have sensory problems in your skin that, that don't follow a dermatome pattern. Like for example, if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, it's not going to follow any specific dermatome pattern because it's actually a problem with the median nerve, a peripheral nerve. It's not, it's not a problem that originates, um, at the, at the level of the spinal cord. All right. So be able to classify your reflexes. Let me click this so I can make it a little higher. Be able to classify reflexes. Uh, so there's different types of reflexes. So first we have, let's see, monosynaptic versus polysynaptic. So like the name implies, a monosynaptic reflex has one synapse. That means the sensory nerve is directly connected to a motor nerve. Polysynaptic reflexes, they're going to have more than one synapse. So that means that interneurons are probably involved. These, these neurons that help with coordination and, and, and association, that kind of stuff. But it also might mean that multiple spinal segments are involved. So a monosynaptic reflex, the key advantage is they're the quickest reflexes we have. So if you need something to happen really quickly, just having one synapse makes the most sense. A sensory nerve directly connected to a motor nerve. Polysynaptic reflexes are going to be much more complex. They're going to take a little longer, but they're going to involve multiple spinal segments, maybe different sides of the body, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they're, they're probably sending information up the spinal cord as well. So monosynaptic, one synapse, the key advantage is speed. Polysynaptic, mul multiple synapses, the key advantage is complexity. Next, I put innate versus acquired. Innate reflexes are genetically determined. You're born with them. Like you can do a neurological exam on an infant and there are things that will happen, right? There are automatic responses to stimuli that will happen. So, and there are, there are other like deep reflexes you can use. I mean, there are reflexes involving things like anal sphincters and stuff that you know what's going to happen unless someone has a neurological problem. That is a pre-built neuron. We come with that as, or reflex, sorry. We come with that as part of our operating system. Acquired reflexes have to be learned. So things that we, things that we learn over time. Um, let's see, somatic, uh, somatic reflexes versus visceral reflexes. So usually we think of things like the knee jerk reflex. Um, so somatic reflexes are going to, are going to be, uh, involving skeletal muscle, your somatic nervous system, visceral reflexes will be more, would be more organic. Um, so there are reflexes that actually affect smooth muscle glands, that kind of stuff. Um, the last different way to classify reflexes would be, did we say spinal? Yeah, it was so, so spinal versus cranial. So your cranial reflexes are going to involve your cranial nerves, whereas spinal reflexes will involve your spinal nerves. So again, usually when you're thinking about reflexes involving like the biceps and the triceps and your, and your with, uh, knee, knee jerk reflexes, those are spinal reflexes, but there are cranial reflexes too. If I shine a light in your eyes, there are things that are going to happen at each eyes that I can keep an eye on, et cetera, et cetera. So spinal versus cranial reflexes just a matter of location. All right, let's see. Know the key reflexes. So I put the withdrawal reflex on here. The, uh, this, uh, the, the flexor, re this would be an example of a flexor reflex where when there's a painful stimuli, you withdraw from it by contracting flexors. You pull back and pull away from it. So that would be your withdrawal reflex. Um, tend tendon reflexes, that's going to be the, the that's going to be the uh, the knee jerk reflex that you would think of from when you go to the doctor, when you rapidly stretch a muscle by hitting a tendon and pulling on that muscle indirectly, it's going to, the muscle's going to contract to make, to try to keep that muscle from tearing basically. So when you, when you hit a tendon on a muscle, you can, you can force that muscle to, to quickly contract. So you've all heard of the knee jerk reflex, but you can do that to the biceps, the triceps, the, um, you can do that to your Achilles tendon, et cetera. So those are examples of tendon reflexes. The most complex reflex that we would have covered 
is called the crossed extensor reflex. And that's because it's really going to be a flexor or withdrawal reflex on one side and a reflex on the other side of the body that stabilizes you. So let's say you step on a Lego. So I, I have a four-year-old. So you step on a Lego. You're going to, with my right foot, I stepped on a Lego. So I'm going to withdraw from that Lego. I'm going to pull back. Well, that's what's happening on the right side of the body is a withdrawal reflex. The other side of the body is going to, the flexors are going to, contra or the, the extensors are going to contract to stabilize me so I don't fall over. So that's, that's called an across extensor reflex. While we're getting flexion on one side of the body because I'm pulling my leg away from that Lego or tack, whatever, the, other, the, the left side of my body is extend, those muscles are extending to, to, to receive my body weight to stabilize me. So those are just the key examples of reflexes that we would have covered. So, all right, that's the basics of the spinal cord and reflexes. Crush it.